thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to speak here. It's always a pleasure at this time of the year to uh, address an audience that are interested in learning about the management of mood matters. The purpose behind the talk is to address the management of mood uh, problems, depression and bipolar disorder, hopefully in a way that makes some sense to you. I'm not really going to go into terribly much detail about different medications uh, because one of the big uh, sticking points for many people with depression and their families is that finding that magic treatment, whether it's a psychotherapy or an antidepressant or a mood stabilizer to sort out a mood problem, that frequently isn't the issue. Uh, the issue is actually knowing what aspect of a mood disorder you're treating. Is it depression? Is it bipolar disorder? Is it a mixed mood? Is it rapid cycling mood disorder? And so on. So a lot of the emphasis will be on that. I will go through some aspects of the medication and in the question and answer session at the end, uh, I'll be quite happy to, to address more particular questions. So one of the most important aspects of treating depression or bipolar disorder is developing a positive therapeutic or treatment alliance. Because if you haven't got that, almost any treatment you prescribe, psychotherapy or medication, is unlikely to succeed. May succeed, but much, much less likely to succeed. What needs to be brought to the endeavor is an area or a sense of collaboration, uh, looking at effective qualities within the therapist where there is positive regard for the person being dealt with, that it's dealt with in a non-judgmental and warm way, uh, that there is a lack of tension within the um, uh, relationship, and that there's positive expressions of verbal and non-verbal communication. It's important that the therapist, doctor, listens and explores and tries to clarify uh, what's happening within the person's uh, life. To encourage patient participation in the sense that uh, questions are welcomed, that they, the person is given uh, a reasonable opportunity to hear a, a coherent answer, uh, that uh, dialogue is continued through the keeping of a mood diary, and that it's very clear that each time the person comes to the session that they have been encouraged to develop their own agenda for the meeting. Adequate time to discuss any of the concerns that arise on either side um, are, are extremely important. It's been said for so long now that uh, one of the most fundamental qualities within a psychotherapeutic uh, relationship is the ability to show uh, unconditional positive regard for the person that you're dealing with, to remain empathic and respectful of the person's complaint, their situation, their background, whatever it may be. Because for so many people with mood problems, they become so enveloped in the experience that it's very hard to uh, see beyond uh, many of the thoughts that... Um, imprison them within this mood state. In developing, uh, as I say, in, in terms of the treatment of uh, depression, once that um, good therapeutic relationship has been developed, the next thing is to try and look at why is this person experiencing depression? Is it due to losses or uh, persistent threat of losses in the person's life? Is it related to past emotional, physical, and, or, or sexual traumas? Is it related to a family history of depression or bipolar disorder? Or alcohol, street drugs, uh, steroids, hormones, and other mood-altering uh, uh, experiences? The next question to ask, having established some understanding of what's maybe behind it all, one needs to look at the particular nature of the depression. In other words, the signs and symptoms that person is experiencing. 
because if a depression, it should be possible at an outset on the basis of an understanding of the person's history, their personality, their family background, the signs and symptoms, whether they have a depression that is likely to benefit from um, antidepressant medication or is, it going to benefit, is the person going to ben- benefit primarily from psychotherapy. So when we look at depressions that do best with antidepressants, the key aspect within those depressions is there's an element of what we call psychomotor slowing, basically a slowing down of the mental process, process and thus the physical process. And that can be encapsulated under a disturbance of feeling, energy, sleep, and thinking. So in other words, that within the, uh, under the heading feeling, it's where the person is feeling depressed, sad, uh, bored, uh, lack of energy, where the person's energy uh, is, uh, is very much on the wane and the person feels extremely fatigued. Uh, when it's sleep disturbance, it's generally where the person has a broken sleep pattern, waking very early in the morning, and or sleeping longer than usual. Typically, the person does not have trouble getting to sleep at night. So we encapsulate that under the mnemonic FEST. In other words, feeling, energy, sleep, or thinking. If they're not significantly disturbed within a depression, uh, it's much less likely that the person is going to benefit from almost any antidepressant. So with depressions that are more likely to respond to psychotherapy, it's where there is little or no psychomotor slowing, where there's a specific loss that has not been mentally processed by the person, uh, or where there's a past history at an earlier stage in their life of traumas of a variety of different sorts, or where the depression is primarily related to the person's underlying personality. So one of the, moving on to look at sort of the broader aspects of managing depression, uh, so we tend to underestimate very significantly the importance of support groups. Support groups where people come together and individuals have an opportunity to share with one another their symptoms, where they have an opportunity to be with others who can identify with uh, exactly the symptoms that the person is going through. There's a great sense of unburdening in, in those situations, and it's hard to really get across to you how valuable people who go to support groups find that. It's an opportunity to get information uh, from people who have a lot of experience in dealing with mood problems, where people can learn to recognize symptoms of their condition, and if the person is beginning to relapse, it's often an opportunity for people to uh, develop an increased awareness of the early symptoms of relapse. So many people who go to support groups will tell you that having somebody there that as they improve, that they can in turn help and uh, be supportive too. And finally, instilling hope is an an essential part of any group. And many of these things happen spontaneously. Now, they're often seen as simple, um, but the point is that when you survey people who attend support groups, well over 90% of people Uh, will list the top uh, three or four items on that uh, slide. So when it comes to treating depression, now this is depression where we've already established that the depression is one where the individual has um, evidence of psychomotor slowing. It's reckoned for mild depressions that many different interventions of a non-drug nature can be helpful not necessarily for everybody. There's good evidence to support the effect of exercise on somebody who is mildly depressed. Uh, Many uh, items of research have shown time and time again that cognitive behaviour therapy is particularly effective for those, again, with mild depression, but much less successful for those with moderate depression 
and probably not at all recommended for people with moderately severe or severe depressions. There's some evidence that light therapy also can be helpful in terms of uh, particularly for people who experience uh, winter depressions. And this is where a person uh, is exposed to bright light equivalent to bright sunshine at 10,000 lux. And this um, helps um, change certain aspects of the alertness in the brain, uh, which in turn alters the level of melatonin. So for a mild depression at a very simple level, one of the most effective things is trying to help the person to focus, if they can, on taking very small steps in the way they manage their lives. Now by small steps, I mean really small steps, like tying your shoelaces, like making a cup of coffee, like just the simplest thing. And very often, it, it, this can be done in quite a mindful way if the person is absolutely focused as much as they possibly can on, the, on those simple acts. Because once the person focuses on those acts, they take their mind away from the negative pictures uh, that they're normally um, zoning in on, where they're looking at a mountain of problems ahead of them. And how am I possibly going to get through this? I feel so depressed. How am I going to get by this? Well, the way to do it is small step after small step after small step. Because once you develop momentum in that way, uh, frequently the person can do an awful lot more than they can credit themselves with. So if a person is suddenly parachuted into a situation like a support group or like going and visiting somebody or somebody comes to visit them, they're often surprised at how they can manage so well with this when uh, maybe the simplest ta task prior to that seemed impossible. Now, for moderate depression, uh, there are a variety of different uh, treatments available. And I'm not going to uh, go into them too much in detail, but frequently what you will find is uh, different people who prescribe uh, medications, be it a GP level or a um, psychiatrist level, they have their own repertoire of things that they know work for them. So when I talk about uh, particular treatments, part of it is what I would experience is useful uh, in, for the practice I'm involved in. Uh, but it doesn't mean that other people's uh, way of doing it is necessarily any more successful or less successful. So it's important in that sense to uh, keep a, a broad mind on the way we'd, we would approach these things. When dealing with a moderately severe depression, uh, which is in itself quite disabling, um, it's probably true to say that few of any of the psychotherapies uh, on their own are effective. Research after research has indicated this over the past three decades. If an antidepressant on its own isn't adequate, sometimes that antidepressant needs to be supported with other medication. When you look at the chemistry or biochemistry, should I say, of what's involved in depression. It's often a cascade of different chemical messengers, neurotransmitters in the brain, one triggering another, another, and so on. So that when we talk about many of the different antidepressants we use today, they are very focused in what they do, and they probably don't in any way hit most of the targets that may be involved in depression. You're familiar with serotonin, you're familiar with noradrenaline, you're familiar with dopamine from uh, other talks you've been to and uh, literature that you've read. But they're probably just scraping uh, the top of the surface. So frequently you will find that people with severe depressions um, that are likely to respond to antidepressants it's not that they need more and more of the same antidepressant, but frequently, as a principle, what they need is, uh, we say, um, a, serotonin, uh, a serotonergic antidepressant, such as sertraline or lustral. But if that is ineffective, very often then other things that can be added to it that will 
boost the chances of the person responding to the antidepressant without necessarily having additional side effects. So this is often why it takes that sort of broader approach in the use of medication to try and uh, get the person um, out of their depression. So the second uh, item listed there is L-tryptophan. L-tryptophan is an amino acid, and it's been, um, it is the amino acid that we have in our food that helps make serotonin in the brain. It's been shown that people, for example, who get uh, winter depressions in particular have a deficiency of this amino acid, and taking L-tryptophan helps uh, the recovery process. But, I hasten to add, it only works for those who are already on an antidepressant. Taking L-tryptophan on its own probably has no antidepressant effect as such. Now, so, so if somebody is on an antidepressant and they haven't responded to it, you would expect that, on average, maybe the other uh, 30 to 40% of people who haven't responded to an antidepressant, uh, maybe a third of those, maybe another 20%, would respond once uh, um, L-tryptophan, or Optimax, it's also known as, uh, is added to the treatment. <laughs> Likewise with lithium. If lithium is used in very small doses, lithium is a salt that you typically associate with the, for the treatment of big highs and, and big lows of bipolar disorder, but in smaller amounts, it frequently boosts the antidepressant effect uh, in a way that is really uh, quite um, dramatic. So often within a two-week period of lithium being added to an antidepressant, uh, the person uh, will make a, a good recovery. There's a lot of evidence from the research literature suggesting that antipsychotic medication is useful for treating depression. I'm not all that sure um, that that is necessarily the case um, because often what happens is that when antipsychotic uh, agents are used, um, they're particularly uh, useful in people who are going through a period of elation and they help to stabilize mood in that sense. But it's not unusual for these antipsychotic agents to have a depressing effect on quite a lot of individuals. So why might the literature be saying that it's useful for treating depression? Well, one of the problems is that many of the... Uh, drug studies that have been done, and much of this research has taken place at a time when the recognition amongst uh, clinicians of unpleasant highs that masquerade of, uh, as depression was not that clear. So in other words, when people were recruited for drug studies, those that allegedly had depression, did they have depression or was it an unpleasant high? Because yes, in, in that instance, yes, the antipsychotic would be extremely effective in those instances. For se severe depression, the treatments are pretty much the same as for moderate depression, uh, but one or two other uh, points would, can be usefully made. There's almost no antidepressant on the market. In fact, there isn't a single one antidepressant on the market that works on the dopamine system. Now, probably the core aspect that goes uh, uh, askew during uh, uh, bipolar disorder, certainly on the high side, is uh, a disturbance of dopamine. And likewise, there's a relative deficiency of uh, dopamine in people during a depression. Uh, so a compound called premipexol is frequently used for people who have a particularly treatment-resistant depression, and it's been uh, shown to be extremely effective. Sometimes people have depressions where maybe there's an awful lot of anxiety uh, and panic attacks or depression with a lot of social anxiety. And then uh, medications such as MAOIs, they are things like uh, uh, Parnate and Nardal. These are compounds that you can't take cheese or alcohol with when you're on those compounds. And that has proven to be quite effective. In very severe instances where the person is extremely suicidal for a prolonged period of time and their life is at risk, uh, or if the person has severe what we call uh, 
delusional depression, in other words, where the person feels and is very convinced that they're evil, that they're wicked, that they're damned, and they will do anything to end their own lives. Frequently, um, ECT is extremely helpful in those instances. But for the vast majority of people, even with severe depression, ECT uh, is no longer uh, used at all as widely as it used to be. When you look at treatments such as the present-day antidepressants or when uh, L-tryptophan or lithium or premipexol are used in combination to deal with these. So in terms of what are called the SSRI antidepressants, I'm just trying to orientate you at this stage uh, to some of the names and the generic name. So the trade name is unbracketed and the generic name is bracketed there. Um, so they're the main ones that you would be familiar with. Is there a difference from one to the other? I don't know. I don't think so. What you will find is that maybe the side effect profile of each of them is slightly different. And in that way, people have preferences. But when you actually look at their core antidepressant effect, there's very little difference in um, the if a person responds to one, there's a fair chance that they're going to respond to another. So uh, the next group, just to draw your attention to, are those that uh, block the reuptake of uh, both serotonin and adrenaline. Now, many of the older-fashioned antidepressants, such as anaphronal or clomipramine, I put it purposely under that heading because it would have been and is um, probably uh, one of the most effective antidepressants. Uh, It uh, has the difficulty of causing dry mouth and constipation, and therefore it tends to be only used in very low doses for that reason. But there are ways around that. Uh, It being so effective, very often um, L-tryptophan or other compounds added to it will boost its effect. Um, another effective antidepressant is Effexor or Venlafaxin. And uh, a more recent addition to uh, treatment is Cymbalta or Deloxetine. Now, just some other antidepressants to mention. One is uh, a compound called Zispin. Uh, can be a useful antidepressant, but one of the uh, many reasons for which it's prescribed is that it is quite sedative. And what you will find very often with the other antidepressants I was showing you, uh, particularly the more modern antidepressants, they are not particularly helpful at helping people who have uh, a disturbed sleep. And for people who are depressed and disturbed sleep, anything that can be done to try and assist that uh, is is very much welcome. Um, Another compound that's used in that instance is amitriptyline, which is a, a more old-fashioned antidepressant, but again, is particularly helpful uh, at uh, producing uh, a relaxing effect um, and for helping sleep and appetite. Optimax, or L-tryptophan, I've mentioned, and mirapexin uh, is the trade name for premipexol, the dopamine-enhancing uh, antidepressant that I mentioned. So what about the treatment of resistant depression? How does it happen? Well, why does it happen? Number one is that it's a variant of rapid cycling mood disorder. But the person frequently only mentions the lows. They don't see the highs. They're unrecognized. So if a person is having a high, which is followed by a low, and they only describe the lows, they will frequently say, no, I only get depressed. I never get high. Sometimes their depressions aren't actually depressions, but unpleasant highs uh, or dysphoric, hypomanic episodes or what we call mixed moods. And during that, the person feels depressed, but they're also quite agitated, restless, impatient, frequently have trouble getting to sleep at night, tend to feel worse in the evening, and there's a lot of agitation or anger. There are features you don't see in typical depression. 
Another reason for treatment-resistant depression is where there are other factors outside the biological ones that I'm referring to. In other words, where the person has... uh, There's an emotional reactiveness within the person to battles that are going on in their head, very often in relationship to childhood traumas. So losses, personality-related problems, alcohol or drugs, there are many other explanations of why a person's depression can be treatment-resistant. Now, frequently, you might say, well, you know, all this is very obvious. But when somebody is depressed, it's not actually always that obvious. People forget to give you the information or are embarrassed to give you the information. And therefore, people end up on treatment after treatment or in and out of hospital where, um, again, the issue is a lack of information that's useful in helping the person resolve the, uh, the, the problem. So again and again, you'd see me coming back to the same issue, that it's the quality of the relationship between the therapist, doctor, psychotherapist, and the patient. Because it's uh, creating an atmosphere that allows people to be open and expressive of uh, the information they have and their, their concerns. So frequently, um, just to go back briefly to that, um, the treatment of treatment-resistant depression is actually trying to dig in to see what is it you're dealing with. Um, Treatment-resistant depression, uh, where it's a clear-cut biological depression and that should respond to one or other of the medications I've mentioned, that pretty much always get sorted out. But what you will find is, time and time again, when it can't be sorted out, it's that the person has a rapid cycling mood disorder, that neither they nor their family see that the person goes high, and they will be absolutely confident that there's no evidence of highs. But once you ask them to start keeping a daily diary of what's happening, lo and behold, oh, you were right. (laughs) In other words, The highs were there all the time, but they're simply just overlooked. So it's not that there's any magic treatment for treatment-resistant depression. It's the same as any other depression. It's actually uh, plucking out those that really shouldn't be uh, actively treated with with antidepressants. So, for example, if somebody is drinking alcohol in an excessive amount um, and either concealing it or... Um, being indifferent about giving the information, um, you will frequently find, yes, standard antidepressants don't work. So moving on to the treatment of bipolar 1 disorder um, and the treatment of hypomania and mania. I don't know how that happened anyway. It's useful to look at the treatment of hypomania and mania in, in, uh, from the point of view of the severity of the condition. If, the, if somebody is going through a high and it's relatively mild and there are no behavioral disturbances, what I mean by that is the person isn't um, fighting with everybody around them or spending a lot of money or driving in a reckless way. Um, frequently, you can treat uh, the condition out of hospital Uh, with low-dose antipsychotic agents, or if the person um, is likely to benefit from lithium, that that should be considered, and I'll come back to that in a moment, or Epilim in low dose. Now, Epilim is an anticonvulsant mood-stabilizing agent that um, is uh, quite effective, uh, but generally, um, in those instances, um, it would really fall between the low-dose antipsychotic and lithium, uh, as far as I can see. Uh, one of the reasons for using the lithium is this, that if a person has a history of highs and lows when they come and they've been off all treatment um, and they've never been on something like lithium before, uh, frequently it's an opportunity to find out if that person is mildly elated is, the, is it likely that their mood, their uh, disturbed uh, mood, the high that they're going through, uh, is it going to respond to lithium? 
The thing is that when you prescribe lithium in a reasonable dose, generally within two to three weeks you will see uh, a very prompt change and stabilization of the person's mood. Uh, what you will often find with low-dose antipsychotics, it takes the top off the high and maybe the middle part off the high, but often there's a, a thread of the high running through um, the mood and it may take several weeks actually for the person's mood to come back down to normal. Most patients will tell you that when they're on something like lithium versus an antipsychotic agent in terms of long-term prevention, there's a better quality of life uh, with lithium. There's less um, uh, fluctuations in mood and um, much of the problems of extreme weight gain and alterations in glucose and um, cholesterol uh, do not happen with it. Lithium has its own issues, but um, it's not as um, severe in that sense. For somebody with a moderate to severe um, to, um, elation, they do need antipsychotic medication. Now, the advantage of antipsychotic medication over lithium is that it works pretty much straight away. Not 100%, but 70-80% of uh, the mood can be contained with medication fairly promptly. Whereas with lithium, you're going to be waiting two to three weeks. So in this instance, what you end up doing is frequently using a combination of the antipsychotic and lithium or epilim on the basis that once the person's mood stabilizes and settles and they come out of the high, the uh, antipsychotic agent can be withdrawn and hopefully the person's mood will stay steady with the lithium. They need a quiet atmosphere uh, during the time of the high. It's important that the person gets a good night's sleep. And they give up the old mobile and reduce the coffee. So two, two pleasures in response for two pleasures. So in other words, if a person is continuing to be excessively stimulated, um, the high itself perpetuates itself by the increased activity that the person has. So that having quietitude in, in the person's life is, is, is a very necessary part of it. And for many people with severe highs, it is going to inevitably result in hospitalization. If one could pick up elation at an early stage, uh, that wouldn't happen. Uh, depression being a painful experience, it tends to be picked up fairly quickly. Uh, elation, on the other hand, uh, it's, uh, people uh, frequently don't recognize it in the early stage, and it's thus difficult. For many, many people, unfortunately, uh, a high is going to be followed by a low, and uh, preparing uh, to try and get the medication down as, as smartly as, uh, as possible once the person's mood changes uh, is important. So when you come to treat the, the depression of bipolar disorder now, as opposed to the high side, the first thing is really to make sure it's depression. No agitation, no restlessness, no irritability, no impatience, and no trouble getting to sleep. If they're there, you've got to think, well, is this depression, or is this an unpleasant high or a mixed mood state? Is that clear enough to everyone? No. Okay. For a mild depression within bipolar disorder, um, you, you want to try and use the mildest antidepressant that's there because the risk is by using an antidepressant, you're going to kickstart another disturbance of the mood into a high. Lamictal, which is a mood stabilizing agent, um, but more importantly is effective as a gentle antidepressant, can be very useful for treating a mild depression. Uh, the only significant side effect with it is a rash, and if people experience that rash, it's important that they stop it straight away. If Lamictal hasn't proven effective, 
uh, a more effective uh, antidepressant is needed, such as uh, Lustral or Lexapro or one of the other SSRIs. If they on their own aren't sufficient, often L-tryptophan or lithium are added uh, for the moderate and severe depressions. Now, tr- um, if, if neither of those approaches work, people will often switch the S, uh, SSRI for an SNRI. Uh, there, uh, again, to remind you, compounds such as Effexor and Cymbalta. Uh, frequently then, uh, for those who are particularly resistant and have a prolonged depression, uh, the dopamine agonist Mirapexin is extremely useful. And again, as I said, within the literature, there is this um, uh, point that uh, antipsychotics uh, agents such as Syracuse and Zyprexa are useful for treatment of bipolar depression. I'm afraid I remain skeptical. Um, And then, um, just to say as a fact, ECT is useful in those instances as well, um, but it is rarely used because it is very likely to not just get the person out of a depression, but um, trigger another high. So it would be exceptional circumstances. So let's move on and talk about uh, bipolar 1 disorder and the prevention of recurrences. What bipolar 1 disorder, the 1 means is that the high is a severe high and it's followed by a depression. And typically it has what we call an MDI pattern, a mania followed by depression, followed by a normal thymic or a normal mood interval. And there's then a gap of months to years before that happens again. But the point is that when it happens a second and a third time, the chances of it continuing to happen within uh, shortening intervals is, is very high. In those instances, lithium prevents recurrence of the mania in 70 to 90% of instances. So it's important to uh, bear that fact in mind. If the person continues to have depressions, even though the highs have been limited, then substances such as uh, Lamictal... Um, so, uh, sorry, I've gone on a bit. The remaining depression does well, as I said, with lamictal or with low doses of carbamazepine or tegretol. Because what you'll find is with a lot of those uh, anti-convulsant mood stabilizers, in low doses, they're particularly useful as um, antidepressants. And in high doses, they are more mood stabilizing. If lithium doesn't work um, to prevent a recurrence, And that may be the case if the person has uh, a lot of um, uh, more severe relation, which I'll come to in a moment. Other aspects such as, or other treatments such as antipsychotic medication, Epilim, or another anticonvulsant mood stabilizer called Topamax or Topiramate uh, has a particularly anti-manic effect. Now, this slide doesn't exactly convey um, what I was trying to get across, but the idea was that when people move on to have bipolar 2 or bipolar 3 mood disorders, the first depression may happen in the teens or 20s. Uh, There's a gap then maybe of 10 years before there's another episode. And then uh, at um, increasingly shorter intervals, um, there are depressions. The bipolar 2, bipolar 3 will often uh, commence for the first time in the uh, 40s and 50s and it frequently presents as a depression followed by a high. Now that high is often quite mild and that's why um, we refer to it as bipolar 2. So what bipo- you may remember that I said bipolar 1 is where a person has a big high. Bipolar 2 is where the high is uh, quite mild. 
and pr sometimes so mild that it doesn't even reach diagnostic criteria of being a high. But even if it's only present for a few hours, it is significant because that high <coughs> is the harbinger of the next high or the forerunner of the next low that is going to occur. So you're into a situation where the low followed by the high, followed by a low, followed by a high, is into what we call uh, almost a rapid cycling phase. So bipolar 2 refers to, again, depressions of moderate to severe nature lasting at least two weeks, followed by periods of hypomania. And the periods of hypomania um, are sometimes very mild, but still they're extremely important that they're spotted. So the bipolar 2 uh, refers to spontaneous uh, occurrences of mood disturbance. Um, I'm afraid we're missing the other two uh, legs of this uh, bipolar 3. Uh, bipolar 3 uh, refers to depressions, recurring depressions, which when treated with an antidepressant, which when treated with an antidepressant, induce a high. So somebody who has a recurring depression that goes to a high after antidepressants or ECT or steroids or alcohol, we call it bipolar 3. So the patterns, as you see, are, are, are there at the end. So the, the steps in dealing with um, bipolar 2 and bipolar 3 uh, that we have to focus very much on the education um, of uh, the person with the condition because frequently it's just, as far as the person concerned, their mood is all over the place or they have a persistent or recurring depressive condition or prolonged episodes of depression. But the reality of it is that um, the person can be helped um, through education and by keeping a daily mood diary and graph, they can get a very good understanding of the pattern of the condition and hopefully buy into how it can be managed. So the first aspect of treating uh, bipolar 2 uh, mood disorder um, or preventing it, should I say, is to treat the highs. Because until those highs, even though they might be very brief and only lasting hours to days, if they're allowed to recur unchecked, uh, you won't make any headway in <coughs> preventing the recurrences of the next depression. So what you have to do, first of all, is reduce or stop the antidepressants. Now, the person is often wedded to their antidepressants as the thing that uh, helps them most over the years, but it's also the thing that perpetuates the recurrence of it. The second thing, then, is to try and stabilize the person's mood problem with a, a variety of different medications. So the main medications that are used in those instances as first-line treatments are things like Epilim, which, again, is an anticonvulsant mood stabilizer, Tegretol or carbamazepine, which again is an anticonvulsant mood stabilizer, and Topamax. Now, each one of those are sort of more, uh, they have different degrees of antimanic effect. For example, the most antimanic of those are, are anti latent would be Topamax. The next would be Epilim. The least would be carbamazepine. And depending on how uh, large the highs are that occur in bipolar 2, it'll often give you an idea of what, uh, what would be the best treatment. Again, as in dealing with uh, bipolar 1, you sometimes, if the person is very disabled with the condition on an ongoing basis and you have to get on top of the thing fairly quickly, an antipsychotic uh, mood stabilizing agent such as Zyprexa or Syracuse or Risperdal or um, Abilify um, is, is useful. The problem is that very often those compounds have more uh, side effects in terms of weight gain, uh, elevated cholesterol, elevated blood sugar, increasing the risk of diabetes. But it's a reasonable chance, or not chance, it's an, a, re a reasonable approach to take to give the person uh, some uh, ease in their distress 
and very often reduce significantly their suicidal potential until the epilim or the tegretol um, has uh, proven effective. Now, when it comes to uh, using these compounds, um, sorry, when it comes to using these compounds, um, they've got a hierarchy of effectiveness. I've put lithium down at the bottom. It's not that it's off the list as something that can be helpful in bipolar 2 or in those with rapid cycling mood disorders, um, but it only works in 20 to 30 percent of people. But for those that it works, it really does work. So if a person isn't responding to um, epilim or tegretol or an antipsychotic agent, uh, frequently lithium uh, will be helpful. Um, albeit only in 20 to 30 percent of instances, but um, it produces a dramatic uh, change for the person. So in terms of um, dealing with, we've, we've, we've dealt with now within that bipolar 2 and within rapid cycling, the high has been sorted out. The person is no, no longer having highs but there's a fair chance that they're still going to have an element of depression. And the first thing to do in that instance is to ask, well, if we reduce the mood stabilizer, would that lessen the person's locked-in state into depression? The next thing then is to consider the gentle antidepressants such as lamictal, because it is often quite effective in those instances without tending to put the person high. And if that doesn't work, well, then you've got to look at uh, low uh, doses of antidepressants. So moving on to the treatment of rapid cycling mood disorder. The term rapid cycling mood disorder came out of the initial stage of the lithium treatment area, era. What was found was that people who did not tend to respond to lithium uh, who had a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, they frequently had one big thing in common. They were having four or more cycles of mood uh, per year. So rapid cycling refers to four episodes per year. Now what they mean by this, one needs to be careful about. It's two weeks of depression, a minimum of, uh, four to seven days of elation, so if that's the cycle. Now the interval between the next one has to be two months or more. So you can only fit on that basis four of them into the one year. But then there are people who have <coughs> ultra rapid cycling moods where their mood changes several times during the day or from day to day or af after an interval of two or three days. Now the cause of rapid cycling mood disorder is not always that clear. It may be that the person starts with a certain cyclical phenomenon and just as the years go by, the intervals between them shorten. But sometimes you will find that there are specific causes, such as the hormonal changes of the postnatal state. Or if a woman suddenly has to um, lose its hormonal effect from ovaries because ovaries have maybe had to be removed as a um, uh, cancer uh, prevention or uh, treatment therapy. Frequently, that sudden change in hormonal profile causes an instability in the mood-regulating center of the brain. And again, likewise with antidepressants, it's possible that people, as they age, that their brain, in the context of depression or bipolar disorder, is more sensitive to the um, dose of antidepressant that they're on, that they frequently require a lower dose of antidepressant. Frequently you'll find that in, in the literature and what's on, um, available in chemists that uh, antidepressants uh, are frequently far too potent. Now that might puzzle you when we're talking about the treatment of depression and the treatment of treatment-resistant depression. And you might think, well, all we need is more of the antidepressant. No, actually, that is not the case. 
because the vast majority of benefit that a person is going to have from an antidepressant is actually had from a lower dose of it. So higher doses don't necessarily uh, at all add benefit and may add more side effects. So it's often lower doses, but very often you have to combine that with Optimax or lithium or Premipexol or other things like that. So it's, it's a broader approach to it. So phase one of the treatment of rapid cycling mood disorder. This is where the person is maybe having uh, two or three weeks of a depression or shorter, a high that lasts uh, a few days. I'm going to include ultra-rapid cycling in, in, under this heading. Um, and um, the person would say to you, well, look, you know, you say, well, um, one of the questions the person will ask is, how will I know when I'm normal? In other words, they uh, haven't uh, had normal mood for uh, quite a lengthy period of time. So the first step, again, is to stop the antidepressants. Second step is to use an anticonvulsant mood stabilizer, probably in that order. And again, very often with these compounds, you have to leave them there for a number of months. It depends on how frequent uh, or how long the interval is between the cycles. But once the person is on a reasonable dose of one of those compounds for uh, X number of weeks and they're still getting highs, it means it's probably not been helpful. If they're beginning to see a benefit from it, each time the high is due, it'll be less and less and less until it peters out. So phase three, um, if uh, phase two fails, you would look at antipsychotics such as Zyprexa and um, other um, compounds. And as I said, for a very small group of people, lithium uh, is effective. But it tends to be used uh, down um, at a later stage if the others aren't uh, proving effective. So in dealing with rapid cycling mood disorders and treatment-resistant conditions, one of the most important things is people having patience, I-E-N-C-E, um, because it often takes quite a lengthy period of time to unravel what's going on. Um, some people with uh, rapid cycling mood disorder, they may have had it for years, and it can take maybe the best part of 18 months, two years to unravel it because each one of the treatments you use takes a certain period of time to work out, is this really going to be effective? But if the person knows up front what the time scale is, they learn to become a little bit more patient because the high of the rapid cycling mood disorder makes the person even more impatient and it's very hard for them to sort of uh, sustain their effort in, in dealing with this. Secondly, having a daily mood graph and mood diary where they're beginning to plot what's going on and de um, uh, detail what's going on, it makes sense to them then, um, the, the treatment approach. Otherwise, they're basically lost at sea without a compass. So in dealing with uh, the depressions of a biological nature and the mood uh, disorders of bipolar disorder. The role for the psychological treatment, such as CBT, such as psychoeducation, such as family therapy, uh, such as social rhythm therapy, they all have their place. But the primary treatment, um, as most clinicians would see it, um, has to be medication. Uh, the research has shown time and time again that, uh, yes, when people have a good uh, therapeutic relationship with the doctor or therapist they're involved in, um, the chances of having a successful treatment outcome with the medications I've outlined is very high. But issues that might be arising in a person's marriage may require uh, marital therapy to help um, smooth the ripples that are happening and complicate the treatment or uh, complicate treatment compliance. Uh, likewise, uh, psychoeducation in terms of giving people an understanding of how uh, 
uh, medication is used, how to rate moods, how to spot early symptoms of relapse, how to deal with relatives, what to say at work. All of these aspects of psychoeducation are extremely important. Uh, CBT can be useful for people who have many of what we call the comorbid aspects of, or, uh, that are associated with bipolar disorder. Many, many people, when their mood is stabilized uh, in the context of depression or bipolar disorder, they might still be getting social anxiety, uh, generalized anxiety, panic attacks, uh, agoraphobic features, obsessive compulsive phenomena, and CBT is extremely useful in those instances. Social rhythm therapy uh, refers to the need to have a stable daily existence. Get up at the same time, go to bed at the same time, have your meals at the same time. In other words, it's been recognized that having a stability in which the person needs their life is extremely important because what happens is that if a person's uh, day, uh, night, or wake, sleep cycle is all over the place, and uh, that in turn affects concentration, energy, uh, memory, um, and uh, alters the person's mood. So very simple things like that uh, do have a, a very important part to play. And it becomes more important the more the medication is working. So in other words, as a person is settling down, sometimes you can't get the last bit right because the person um, has a, um, an unregulated lifestyle. Um, uh, that is disrupting things. So to conclude, uh, mood disorders are essentially uh, treatable conditions. It's not, I hope, as you see today, uh, chasing the, the magic uh, tablet. It's actually understanding the condition. It's, is this depression? What type of depression is it? What's causing that depression? How much does the person's drinking contribute to it? their personality, their family history. So all of those things become extremely important in terms of understanding how um, depression can be unpicked in that way. And very often the bigger part of the unpicking has to be done with medication. It doesn't mean that other interventions aren't important. And we know things like CBT, exercise, possibly light therapy, are helpful for people with mild depressions, but uh, of limited use beyond that. Um, so I'll stop now and leave it open for any questions through the chair.